this title of this talk is as Fugo Ing, come on, Fugo, Fugo Ing Glaucoma Surgery. And what I'm really going to highlight is, is uh, some of our ongoing experience with non-penetrating surgery. So by a show of hands here, um, how many are familiar with the, with the concept of non-penetrating surgery? I know that many, many of you are. So uh, I'm going to basically really run through very quickly some of the background slides. Uh, some of the things you already know about, about why we're really trying to get away from trabeculectomy. And you know, every meeting we go, we talk about modifications of one technique or the other. But the bottom line is, we still have a very uncontrolled situation uh, with um, problems in, early, in the early post-operative period, as far as hypotony and shallow chambers, as well as long-term. Uh, when we talk about glaucoma filtering surgery, at least in the subconscious time of space, many different theories out there in terms of what goes into the manufacturing uh, of an appropriate blend. And this has to probably do with a combination of things. One has to do with the flow rate, in terms of how much do we need, actually need to get down to a very low level. The other is more of an issue of the area of flow. And uh, certainly we know from our experience with full fitness procedures as well as with, um, with the mitomycin small applicating, application traps that we want to have more of a diffuse flow to really enhance a more diffuse blend. The advantages of non-penetrating I think are quite clear. Uh, I have, we have written now a number of articles. I won't go through this entire table so you can breathe a sigh of relief. But these are, these are all of the important studies that have been published and this is only, uh, only the last five years. So we have a really advanced uh, level of uh, evidence now that really, I think, supports the safety uh, of non-penetrating, and I think as we're seeing the efficacy as well. But truly one of the big areas that we have not yet been able to overcome is the steep learning curve with the procedure, the variability in the anatomy during the procedure, and really getting to the proper technique. And that's what I hope to really show you with the, um, with this, with the, uh, with the Fugo blade. Uh, again, this is a matter just to show again that Really, if you can strip down and get down to a very thin layer of residual meshwork and decimates uh, through some small micro perforations, we can really get the pressure down very low uh, to levels that uh, would be desirable. Obviously, we have other healing issues to deal with. And the difficulty with non-penetrating is we're trying to get to a very deep dissection. If we go too deep, we can enter the eye. If we're too superficial, we will not get enough flow. And this has been the problem. And this is an example, actually, of a case which is the, the right way to do a non-penetrating procedure. Now, I've done. Uh, a large number of these non-penetrating procedures, uh, probably in the neighbor neighborhood of about 200 per year. So I'm pretty comfortable with, with doing variations of non-penetrating. And I teach our fellows this, but there's a steep, steep learning curve. But as you can see here, we're really uh, very carefully dissecting the scleral flap away from the uh, trabecular meshwork stems canal. You can actually see the outer wall of canal here, and you can see the inner wall here. And this is what we're trying to separate with this dissection. Again, this video shows it nicely, but you know, my purpose of showing this is just, you know, we're talking about, you know, very minute micron level dissection here that, depending on the patient's anatomy and the patient and the surgeon's comfort level, uh, can be very hard to replicate consistently. And this is the message here. But once we get to this level, though, we do have some percolation of aqueous. We don't need a lot. We're, we're not, some of you may be used to seeing a big gush of flow, of flow coming through a trabeculectomy opening. We don't want to see that. We want to see, see a very nice diffuse flow uh, with the maintenance of the anterior chamber. Uh, the number of studies showing that the high, high rate of failure, mainly due to the fact that we're too superficial with the dissection here. This is an example here where you can see dissection has been done, and what's happened is that the surgeon has left a layer of sclera overlying the meshwork. We have to go back and dissect back. It's going to be very hard. Um, here, in fact, I managed to actually revive the dissection and get back enough, but these are very difficult when we have this excess tissue, which is a common problem. The other problem sometimes we face is that, uh, as we said earlier, either we're too superficial, or in this case, when we're dissecting open the flap, we get down, we're fairly content that we can start to see some of the canal. And during the uh, release of the radial incisions, which can be a bit of a tricky, uh, tricky maneuver, we see we have a perforation. And this is, again, one of the reasons why many surgeons have not uh, uh, taken to the non-penetrating procedures, despite the results here. So what we're really trying to do is essentially is remove tissue. We're trying to remove tissue so we leave a very little residual layer of meshwork, that cornus fell meshwork and decimate membrane, we know by doing this surgically, uh, approaching it this way, we can get a leaking uh, membrane here that is sufficient enough to, to lower pressure. So uh, I know that Richard causes, causes this to calls it the fugal blade. I call it my scleral eraser. And really, this is a magnificent instrument to ablate that tissue. So you know, it's quite interesting how we've seen a transition in terms of the use of the, of the uh, fugal apparatus from capsulotomy, difficult capsulotomies and capsulotomy uh, dissections, moving towards scleral. Dalton Singh, of course, is uh, been a pioneer in the um, transcellular filtration area. 
And so when I saw some of the some of the work that had been put out by people like Dalajit and others, I thought this would be a great procedure if we can manipulate this tip with the right energy levels to ablate or erase tissue overlying the meshwork. If we do this in a, in a predictable fashion, we can get down to a desirable level like this fairly effortlessly and achieve the results we're trying to get. Now, one of the problems we have, of course, is are we going to leave, as with, as, with, as with potentially other devices that utilize high levels of, of cautery, the problem is, of course, we're worried about scarring. And we know, of course, the properties of the fugal blade with its plasma-like properties reduce that, uh, that concern. So this is actually my first case with, um, with, the, uh, with the fugal blade using a non penetrating intersection. The superficial flap is pretty simple to do. It's like we do for any trabeculectomy flap, maybe a little bit thinner than we, than we would normally. And then we identify the spur, we identify some of our anatomical landmarks. And I generally start right around the spur level. Often the meshwork is a bit more, the canal is a bit more posterior. And we've been playing around with the energy levels. I've been actually losing, using lower energy levels progressively. Uh, and you see here now, we basically have laid it down and we actually have gotten down to basically where the canal would be. That's the spur here. And we, we have a very controlled um, flow of fluid here. Now I'm attempting to make the membrane a bit larger. I'm going to show you this first case, but I'll show you my more recent case uh, next, and you'll see some of the differences. But even with this case, the patient did very well because we have a we have a membrane that we've made. The size of the membrane may or may not be a, an issue as far as flow. We just want to make sure we get some flow through there. And if I need to, if there is fibrosis, we can always use an, uh, a laser gonium puncture if that membrane were to fibrose, giving us advantage in the postoperative period. I personally like to use a, an implant like the Aquaflow to maintain that space under the scleral flap. And that will allow a conduit of aqueous to form within this scleral lake, as we call it. And from there, aqueous will drain through multiple pathways. Obviously, subconch um, is, is an important uh, means in this, uh, in this approach. And uh, the flap is tied very loosely. It's just meant to, uh, meant to oppose it. Jason, you have a question? Do you still strip? No, there's no need to strip, because really what you're doing with, with, the, uh, with the fugal blade, you're actually ablating that outer wall. Yeah. and ablating some of that inner wall, and, and you're done, so there's no need to strip. Because okay. stripping the inner wall, which you saw in my first video, is a bit of a challenge to some patients, you know, and it's hard to sometimes identify it. Again, experienced surgeons, it's, it can be somewhat routine. The conch flap is tied uh, as per whatever the regular routine is. This situation here, this patient uh, has a number of risk factors. We're actually using mitomycin C here. Obviously a bit of a controversy in terms of using mitomycin, but I think using a large application zone uh, can often help with, the, uh, with, with reducing the incidence of blood fibrosis, which is still an issue with these subconjunctival procedures. After we place the mitomycin, which I place under the superficial flap, we irrigate as we normally would. We haven't entered the eye at this point through the dissection, and we can see our landmarks quite nicely. We can see the glistening spur very well here, up right there, and we'd expect the meshwork to be just anterior to that, to that point. So I'm going to start the dissection again, sort of somewhat in the area of the, of the spur, it is, it is important to identify the spur, and you should be able to reliably identify the spur in every case. It may be one, two, one millimeter back from the limbus, maybe two, three, four millimeters back from the limbus, depending on patient's anatomy and the refractive error. So now this is, a, this is a bit lower energy, a bit more controllable, the section here. And you'll see that basically as we slowly erase that tissue, and you can see there's really minimal of any charring, it's just simply just ablating the tissue away, erasing tissue very carefully, very gently, and then once we get to that aqueous level, once we get that water, then Richard may, may have to explain a bit more about the mechanics of the blade, but then we have less absorption of that energy into the tissue. And so it's almost like a protective phenomena to prevent you from going into the eye. I guess you can say somewhat like, uh, like actual laser in that sense. Uh, and so you can see here quite well now, we've got nice flow, we've got a nice window forming here, and then I make it a bit more anterior. I could have probably stopped here, but again, I'm pretty comfortable with uh, with using this blade, overlying the decimated membrane to get a nice area of flow. You can see here we have nice flow here. We're happy and content that the chamber is, is formed and we'll now decide we can stop here and close up. Again, like I said, I like to use uh, intraspell implant like the aqua flow. Uh, I think the aqua flow has been shown to be an advantage.